loves you. And its mission, the cure epilepsy, is dear to my heart. My older sister, Ellen, developed epilepsy as an infant. Um, she struggled for her life. And we struggled as a family to control her seizures. And sadly, she passed away a few years ago. My mother was diagnosed with epilepsy just a few years ago for a different reason. So it's important to know that epilepsy can strike in and at any time. And we need to learn more about it, talk more about it, and find solutions for it. We have representation from many congressional offices and federal agencies here today and online. And we thank you for your time, your partnership, and your interest in learning more. The recently launched Epilepsy Caucus Co Chairs, Epilepsy Organizations, and Epilepsy Advocacy Community have come together to host this briefing so that we can educate about the epilepsies and the funding priorities for the upcoming fiscal year. You'll hear directly from people with epilepsy, people who care for people with epilepsy, and epilepsy specialists about the needs of the community and how more federal investment into the epilepsies can improve awareness, access to care, and ultimately health outcomes. A recent study reported that the total health care burden for people with epilepsy is at least $54 billion annually in our country. This is not a trivial condition. We'll also provide a brief seizure safety training because seizures can happen anywhere and at any time. And we want everyone to be prepared to safely support somebody who's having a seizure, just like we would if they were having a seizure. We are delighted to be joined by co-chairs of the first ever Epilepsy, Congressional Epilepsy Caucus. It was so exciting to say that after so many years of hoping for this. And Congressman Greg Murphy and Jim Costa launched the bipartisan Epilepsy Caucus to raise awareness, understanding about the epilepsies, as well as implementing meaningful legislation and advocate for funding for epilepsy research in Congress. Before we begin our program, however, somebody from the epilepsy community you may be aware of wanted to give a special thanks for coming today. And this is actor Greg Grunder. Well, hello there. I'm Greg Grunberg, and I want to welcome you to today's congressional briefing on the epilepsies. Uh, you may have seen me in television and, and film, uh, in shows like Felicity, Alias, Lost, Heroes, or in movies like Star Trek and Star Wars. But my greatest role as a father is to three incredible sons, including my oldest, Jake, who lives with epilepsy. His 26, wow, 26 year journey with epilepsy has been heartbreaking, joyful, exhausting, um, inspiring, and so much more. And we've been through what I like to call the epilepsy car wash or the roller coaster. Um, Jake's just like millions of others facing this neurological disease. And as we bounce from doctor to doctor during those early years, we faced many obstacles, but we persevered. Jake would never give up. We would never give up. No seizure could ever stop him, and today he is thriving, thank God. And we're working hard to knock down those obstacles for others touched by epilepsy. But it is a struggle. It continues to be a struggle. We still have significant gaps in research funding. We need better coordination among doctors, patients, advocates, and researchers to improve outcomes, patients, need earlier diagnosis when seizures first happen, and improved surveillance methods that better define the impact of epilepsy on different populations. And then there's the stigma. Oh, the stigma. We still have a very long way to go on combating the stigma of seizures and epilepsy, and that's why it is time to talk about it. I co-founded the Talk About It company many years ago to raise awareness of the epilepsies, remove the stigma, and help to make a real difference, which is what you can do today. I hope today you will learn from our experts, doctors, caregivers, advocates, and people living with epilepsy. And I hope that you will join our effort and do all that you can in Congress to pivot vital funds for Pediatric Onset Epilepsies Consortium and inclusion of the epilepsies in the CDC National Neurological Conditions Surveillance System, among other actions. I urge you, to work with us to improve patient access to care, remove the stigma, and help more patients thrive, just like my son, and really 
hear what we have to say today. And then, guess what? I encourage you to talk about it. Thank you so much. Enjoy the day and keep doing everything that you're doing. We really appreciate it. We thank Greg for that message. Really important points. We are delighted again to be joined by the co chairs of the Congressional Athletic Caucus, Congressman Greg Murphy and Jim Costa. We're so thankful for your leadership and look forward to working with you to grow the caucus, advance funding and policy solutions that will improve the lives of people with epilepsy. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Dr. and Dr. Greg Murphy to North, North Carolina's third district, and then we'll hear, I hope, um, he's able to arrive. <clears throat> um, Congressman Jim Costa of California's 21st district. Congressman. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming out. A couple of y'all um, have heard my stories before. I'm a surgeon by trade, so I do not treat patients with epilepsy. However, many of the patients that I treat have epilepsy. But my particular focus and pull to the, the caucus has been really a personal one. Um, my son, who is now uh, 28, uh, developed epilepsy when he was 14. And it took us about eight months to get his seizures under control. As many of you know, with epilepsy, you don't, it, it is a literally trial and error uh, to be able to determine which drug works best um, for each patient. Some may work great, but they have bad side effects. And so you move along, move along. And my son went through five medications, five different ones, until finally um, one has worked. And now it's worked for 14 years. Uh, he is a race engineer for Dale Jr. and NASCAR, so he gets to do neat things up and out with him on the track, and um, it's pretty neat. So he's been by, he's been blessed to be able to now drive and do all those things, which were a lady question at that time. Um, I will tell you, there's a new family. There's new somebody else in my family now has epilepsy. My sister. Uh, my sister is 62, and she had a questionable seizure a couple of years ago. And I'm not sure quite of all the details, uh, but this past summer, she had a seizure while driving in Raleigh and crashed into a wall and um, totaled her car and some other things have happened since then. And so now she's been trying to get her seizures under control. So, it, you know, it's not that it's a matter of time for each of us, but it is so common that things are happening. You know, going back to just the medications, you know, I, I spoke about this the other day. You have to sometimes just throw them up on the wall in some certain conditions to see which ones fit. Blood pressure medicine, and sometimes with insulin, some of these other things. But what we're always hoping for, and I spoke with a group who has ALS the other day, we're always hoping for being able to turn and look at the dance the next day or pick up a paper and see the next cure, the next treatment. Um, I'm not going to get political here, but I'm hoping that people will understand the IRA last year when we passed put a big damper on some of the research because this is a small molecule. And normally it takes 10 molecules um, to be able to bring one to market. And uh, I'm not pleasing, I'm not um, pleading the case for pharmaceutical companies. But what, what the IRA did was it took instead of 14 years for companies to recoup the losses for those other nine medicines down to nine. And so it's caused a lot of companies, 50 in fact, to draw back and say, well, we may not be proceeding with this medicine. And so sadly enough, we're at a point now where we were just, I, I talked about the fantastic achievements I've seen in my 25, well, 30 year medical career, uh, because new cures, um, you know, with prostate cancer, 10 years ago, I would always, I would have to tell patients sometimes, say, look, there's nothing else. Um, go get your affairs in order, enjoy your family some last days. And now I can tell them, look, you're going to see your grandkids live, you're probably going to see them um, graduate and get married. We want to be able to tell our folks with epilepsy, look, you're going to have a great future. Uh, we may be able to cure you. We may be able to, to give you medicines that are going to be lifelong, that have very few side effects. And so there is a balance between pharmaceutical companies' profits and then still being able to do that groundbreaking research that we want to happen and continue to happen for which the United States has been on the vanguard really for the world. And so hopefully I'm gonna get uh, Representative Costa to join me in trying to slide some of those restrictions back a little bit just so research can continue in the way that it was being done before. So 
I encourage you all, thank you all for coming today. This is a very, very important topic and, and talk about it. Um, this is, it, it is a stigma, uh, as Greg mentioned a few minutes ago, that we have to constantly keep fighting to uh, try to break. So I thank you for all your work today and thank you for having me. There's lots of seats at the front if anybody wants to sit. I'd love to get our future while we're waiting for the time. Right. So, looking for our time. Well, I'd love to Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. Wonderful morning. And it's good to have all of you here and to be joining with my colleague, uh, Dr. Murphy, who uh, uh, shares a profound passion for the uh, desire to uh, ensure that this caucus uh, gets off to a good start for all the right reasons. Uh, clearly, uh, as we know, uh, Epilepsy is a, a health issue that uh, has been with us uh, forever. And uh, each and every one of you should passing one way or another uh, to ensure that we provide uh, education uh, about epilepsy, ensure that we provide support for medical research, ensure that we uh, do everything we possibly can to uh, let America know uh, that um, this um, was uh, an opportunity for very talented, creative, creative people uh, to excel and to exceed uh, far beyond what people understand because of the individual talents that they have. Um, as some of you may know, I uh, represent the uh, Wonderful people at the 21st Congressional District of California. Uh, that involves uh, Fresno and Tulare counties for people who know uh, a bit of the geography in California. We're a big state, uh, as you know, 40 million people, largest state in the country. And some of my colleagues are amused and confused a bit about what goes on in California. And uh, we say, well, you know, the California the East Coast. Stretch from Boston in the north to Charleston in the south. They go, well, that's a bunch of states. Well, bingo. California could be six different states. But obviously, I'm very proud uh, to be a member of that uh, 52 uh, person congressional uh, delegation. And I'm also pleased to be a part of this briefing uh, for FRC. This breakfast to really uh, talk about the challenges that we face. Uh, we all have a story. Uh, as you all know, there's over almost three and a half million, three and a half million Americans, including 470,000 children and teenagers uh, living with active epilepsy in the United States. One in a thousand uh, will die of sudden unexpected death. Um, otherwise, when we stood up, the mortality rate is almost twice the level for African Americans. Uh, financial burdens are clearly made it worse uh, for those who live with uh, epilepsy to have access to the good care they deserve. Um, it's critical, I think, uh, for those uh, who who have epilepsy uh, to voice, to have a voice in Congress, and that's what this is really all about. That's why I'm so excited to have this panel here. So excited to be a part of this founding effort with Congressman Murphy uh, because. It's absolutely critical that you have a voice and that uh, your concerns and your issues are heard and understood. Understood is a critical, I think, a message that I would want to leave you with. So, we're trying to bring members together and experts to implement meaningful legislation for funding epilepsy research in the United States Congress. 
That is the primary uh, um, part of our agenda in this year's Congress. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, working with you because you're one of the organizations for us on breaking the stigma by uh, giving those living with epilepsy mentioned in voice in Congress, the very nation's capital. So I'm very proud to be a founding um, member and co chair of this caucus. And um, let me just aside, and some of you know this story, but uh, we all come to understand issues of health through different paths. Usually it's because we uh, know someone, uh, we have a, a family member, uh, a person that is supposed to it, that is diagnosed with uh, epilepsy. In my case, um, I, uh, gee, I was saying, <laughs> I was thinking about the other day, uh, I, I came to Congress uh, as an intern uh, before I had any of this car kick blind and looking at it. I was 21 years old in my junior and senior year at Fresno State. And uh, I was working in our congressman's office, the congressman BF Sis. And uh, his chief of staff was a person who was known in our in the Valley community, and not even the Portuguese community, by the name of Tony Quo. And uh, you know, Tony was uh, you know, a, a role model for me in the Portuguese community. And so all of a sudden, I'm an intern in the office, and uh, Tony would take the time and meet with the attorneys and you know, try to educate how we can better understand how Congress works. But as a matter of fact, he said uh, one day we were having a conversation, I have epilepsy. I've never met a person who said they had epilepsy and knew very little about the nature of uh, the illness. And he began to explain how he was diagnosed and how it impacted his life. Uh, he was going uh, to school in uh, Loyola in Southern California, so you know where that institution is. And um, he, at the time, uh, wanted to enter the priesthood. And as he likes to tell the story at the time, uh, when he was diagnosed, in the 20 or 21 years of age, uh, the Catholic Church had a bar uh, for those with epilepsy and other kinds of uh, illnesses from entering the priesthood. And he went into depression. He uh, really felt that this was his calling. And he had some friends uh, with some professors there who were mentoring him and said, Look at Tony, there's other paths for you. And and maybe you're not going to become a priest at this time. Uh, but you should um, you know, think about what other things you can do. And he did. And so uh, obviously uh, he had an opportunity to come to Washington and work in the Congress office, become the chief of staff, and then get elected on his own. And, uh, and so he inspired me to share that story with you for those of you who don't know that story. Because we all learn about epilepsy in different ways. And that's how I learned about it. And I learned about what individuals challenge and struggle to be able to as a young person and how he overcame um, his own, you know, insecurities and fears as to whether or not he could lead a productive life. And so really that's a combination of a story I think that we all share in one way or another. And that's why um, I encourage uh, those staff members that are here uh, from different uh, offices uh, to um, encourage uh, your member uh, to join the caucus. Uh, that this is bipartisan. Uh, I think that healthcare in America generally should not uh, be a partisan issue. I mean, all Americans deserve access to good quality health care. And uh, so, um, for those of you who are here um, from different um, offices, uh, go back and, and encourage your, your, your member to why this is a good idea, why they should get involved. And as I said in our last meeting, um, Congressman Murphy and I will do everything we can to reach out and to, to bring in more members. 
but you also can be very helpful. And so when you're walking the halls here, when you're reaching out to uh, people from your own uh, state, uh, let them know that this will be something that uh, they could be very helpful with, that they should get involved and they should participate. Uh, because we need to grow this caucus, and we will grow this caucus, but we can't do it by ourselves. We need your involvement. Uh, so I want to thank all the partners, uh, your efforts and collaboration, including the Epilepsy Action Network, the Epilepsy Foundation, the Cure Epilepsy, the Rare, Rare Epilepsy Network, and the Deep Connections Organizations. All of these play a role. And we must work together to develop the synergy necessary to succeed. Uh, your work is critical, it's important, and it does not go unnoticed. Trust me. So uh, let's continue to work together to improve healthy outcomes. Um, and I want to thank all of you for attending this briefing. And uh, Kit, uh, where's the, uh, in my office? Uh, I mean, it's um, you know, those who help their portfolio home and other important items that should be listed. And um, so um, please don't hesitate if you can't reach me to reach out to Kit. And um, we've got work to do. It's that simple. But together, we can make great progress on the side of this caucus. Uh, I spoke to Tony about this uh, a couple weeks ago. We stay in regular contact. He continues to inspire me and mentor me. Uh, and uh, my gosh, you know, um, 21 years of age, I was here in Washington. Uh, first time I was in the nation's capital working in our congressman's office, wondering what the world would be hold for me in the future. And uh, I think that uh, I've had a wonderful opportunity and the privilege to represent people in California and to help people every day, and that's my passion. So let's work together to make it happen, okay? Thank you so very much. Keep that in mind. Thank you so much. Thank you for that encouragement to join this really important office. It's, uh, it is important, and it is it has been, as I mentioned, long in coming, and we're delighted. Um, it was launched in February, and since then, we actually have 13 uh, members who have joined. And as the congressman put it multiple times, we would love to have um, your, your members join. Um, here's the list of folks who have already joined. And um, the congressman has mentioned his staff member. There's also a staff member in uh, Congressman Murphy's office. So please, uh, we were going to put the information up on the slide. Do we have that available? Yep, here. Um, you reach out to these folks and, and get your, your offices listed as well. Um, so, I want to move on to the main portion of our program, and that is to kick off our panel. To do that, I would like to introduce Dr. Archana Kosovari, who will provide first an overview of the epilepsies. Dr. Pasquiletti is a pediatric neurologist and epileptologist in Washington, D.C. She received her MD from George Washington University School of Medicine. She completed her pediatric residencies and pediatric neurology residency at Children's National Hospital here in D.C., and then did a fellowship in clinical epilepsy at UCSF Ben Hoff Children's Hospital in San Francisco. So I'd like to turn over to my minutes. Thank you, Laura, for the warm introduction. I am honored to speak with all of you today and to share this space with people living with epilepsy, their families, advocates, and stakeholders in the room. I've dedicated my career to advocate for children's health care, and it's been a privilege to treat children with neurologic disorders, and particularly epilepsy, and often rare epilepsy. This looks like me. Uh, this is why we're all here today. Epilepsy is a common neurological disorder that impacts the lives of millions of Americans and their families. One in 20 
and I repeat that number, one in 26, because that's the number I want all of us to remember throughout this morning. If you haven't already been personally touched by epilepsy, chances are you will be. A friend, a neighbor, a classmate, a family member, or even yourself. Today is about giving a voice to those who could not be in the room with us and how we can all make an impact to improve the lives of those living with epilepsy. Thanks. So just like our heart has constant rhythmic electrical activity that causes it to beat, our brain is the same way. Neurons in the brain use electrical and chemical signals to communicate with each other. A seizure occurs when there's a disruption in this activity, and you have a sudden burst of abnormal signals in these cells. The surge of activity can cause involuntary movements, loss of awareness, or abnormal sensation. Epilepsy is a disorder of the brain that is characterized by recurrent seizures. Though people often use the words interchangeably, it's important to note that epilepsy and seizures are not the same thing. Not everyone who has seizures has epilepsy. And that distinction becomes really important as we, as we talk about the epilepsy journey. Next slide, please. Epilepsy can actually be considered a spectrum disorder because of the different seizure types. It's different causes its ability um, to impact a person and the severity of the disease and often coexisting conditions. When we talk about epilepsy, we often talk about what type of seizure someone has, whether they're focal, meaning they start in one location in the brain, or they're generalized where the electrical activity is disrupted all over. Whether of what causes they have, and whether we can put everything together to come up with a diagnosis and a syndrome. Because of this, we are starting to call the disorder the epilepsy to reflect that it is not a static condition and there is a tremendous amount of variation, even within an individual patient. We often say once you've seen an individual with epilepsy, you've actually only seen one person with epilepsy. We continue to make tremendous progress towards understanding the underlying causes of epilepsy from structural changes in the brain, such as injuries, strokes, or malformations of brain tissue at a cellular level, genetic and metabolic conditions that impact the way a brain develops, to infections. However, we are still have almost 50% of patients where we actually don't know the cause of epilepsy. And this is where research for funding and uh, research and funding can really make a difference to the population. The ideology or cause behind epilepsy can make a difference in how we manage treatment, the prognosis, and other comorbid conditions. I put this slide up to show you that I actually think of epilepsy as a disease of the neck. When many of us think about seizures, we may picture uncontrolled jerking of their arms or their legs, people who fall down, have loss of consciousness, maybe bite their tongue. But really, seizures can be more subtle. If you look at all the different areas where there is colors, you can sometimes have dip, uh, abnormal sensations, repetitive movements. Those who often stare or stop do uh, have a pause in their function. Maybe they mix up their words or have confusion. And sometimes we can't see seizures at all. It really depends on where the abnormal electrical activity starts and how it spreads through the networks. We talk about network because the network we often have involved in epilepsy also cause comorbid conditions. In fact, epilepsy can be thought of not just as recurrent seizures, but as neurobiological, cognitive, and psychosocial consequences. The same networks in the brain that are disrupted during seizures are the same pathways uh, in other conditions such as depression, anxiety, memory, executive functioning, 
And these conditions can often be more debilitating to a person's life than the seizures themselves. Um, and to show the most common comorbidities often are depression, uh, anxiety, and ADHD. Patients with epilepsy have a five to six times higher risk of death than individuals without epilepsy. They can have sudden, unexpected death in epilepsy known as pseudo. And while we don't know the cause of pseudo, we do know some of the risk factors. It is seizures that are difficult to control. If you have seizures that occur at night, if you have um, seizures often associated with other comorbid conditions. And in addition to SUDA, there are other mortalities for those living with epilepsy. It can be suicide, drowning, motor vehicle accidents, or even uncontrolled seizures. As we've all, uh, as we've heard earlier today, epilepsy impacts all aspects of an individual's and their caregivers' lives. It can be difficult to maintain a steady job. Um, you can have higher healthcare resource utilization, including increased ER visits, hospital stays, and outpatient visits, medication, and treatment. Oftentimes, if you have seizures, you may not be able to drive. You may not be able to go to your medical appointments, which then complicates the epilepsy journey in terms of adherence to medication and seeking appropriate treatment. We know that those living with epilepsy often have a lower socioeconomic status. The impact of epilepsy cannot be understated. Oftentimes, um, they have difficulty pursuing education, or they have difficulty with employment or maintaining employment. Their overall health care uh, is often impacted and it can impact their household's income. And we can't speak about epilepsy without viewing it in the context of social determinants of health. These factors really determine access to care and specifically access to epilepsy centers, adherence to treatment, getting a timely diagnosis and getting on the right treatment, and even being able to maintain their treatment regimen. Those with lower socioeconomic status, um, it often correlates with the severity of their epilepsy. So if you think about it, if you're having seizures and you're in the hospital or you need frequent days in which you have to take off from work, you will suffer the economic consequences of that. As a clinician, the most difficult conversations I've had with my patients and their families often involve a multitude of these factors because treatment for epilepsy does not exist in a vacuum. And so as we think today about funding priorities, we also have to think about them in the context of these determinants of health. Next slide, please. While we may not be able to cure epilepsy just yet, we continue to advance our therapeutics. In the last several years, we've seen a rapid development of new targeted therapies, specifically for seizure types, as well as certain genetic syndromes, leading to dramatic improvement in seizure control. We have diet therapies. We have devices that can often detect implantable devices that not only recognize seizures as they're occurring, but actually stop them and hopefully retrain the brain's networks to prevent epilepsy. We have brain surgeries that can identify the source of seizures. And once we do, we can actually remove the tissue that's causing the, uh, their seizures. But we also have significant health disparities in this population. And this is where all of you are critical allies in this fight. Not everyone has the same access to care or can afford, can afford the treatments that dramatically improve their lives. Next slide, please. But neuroscience and epilepsy are evolving at rapid speed. The future is really with precision medicine. We continue to identify genes that cause epilepsy and associated conditions. This can allow for earlier diagnosis 
targeted therapies, along with creating comprehensive treatment models for families. And this really impacts the life and quality of a person living with epilepsy. Recently, we've had recommendations and new guidelines that talk about starting genetic testing earlier in the epilepsy diagnosis. And a few weeks ago, scientists have just announced the development of the PAN genome, a DNA model that reflects the current diversity of our population. This new development is no doubt going to bring new insight into the causes of epilepsy, ultimately targeted treatments, and what we all hope for up here. So I'd like to thank you all for being here today and your time uh, in listening to all of the panelists, as well as engaging with the epilepsy community. Our next speaker, Bri Batani, she is a former Team Speak Up participant and an epilepsy advocate from Maryland. Hi, everyone. I'm Pri, and I'm a rising senior at GW right around the corner. Thank you for all of your words. Um, so I was diagnosed with epilepsy in the brain after having an absence seizure at my friend's house. And after being diagnosed, the rest of the grade was a blur. I was in and out of doctor's offices and hospitals and labs, getting EEGs and MRIs and blood drawn and random prescriptions, which is a lot to handle. But the biggest concern I had in my life so far was the one time I Clip on the behavior chart went down from green to yellow. <laughs> I went from having no idea what a seizure was to learning that I have a lifelong diagnosis in just a matter of two days. Throughout the next few years of my life, my epilepsy was a secret that only my family, my doctors, and I shared. It was lonely and burdening holding on to this with no peers to support me. But the way that I saw it, it would be even more lonely if I told my friends because they would see me differently than they did before. And knowing that I had something no one else did was one thing, but having other people know about that was even more terrifying at an age where all you want is to fit in. This lasted until junior year of high school when I had a seizure at an overnight retreat. Unlike the rest of the seizures I've had in my life, this one was by the people who didn't know I had epilepsy. To be precise, a room with over 100 of my peers, who I saw at school every day. Although this was embarrassing and upsetting at the time, this event changed my life forever. Instead of making fun of me, my classmates were supporting me, which had been my biggest fear for the past seven years. After this, things at school were different, but not the way I thought they would be when I was first diagnosed. I decided I no longer wanted to hide myself, that my epilepsy is a part of me, but it will never be something that defines me. I spent so much time being afraid of myself for my diagnosis that I never stopped to think about the amount of people in this world who are just like me. I realized that I didn't need to feel alone with my epilepsy or in sharing my story. I became involved with the Epilepsy Foundation's team speak up, and I volunteered at a camp for children and teens with epilepsy. I met another girl at my school with epilepsy, and we presented in front of the entire student body, along with helping a school-wide fundraiser. My epilepsy has helped me grow and has taught me so much about both life and myself. However, I can't deny that epilepsy has not exactly been my best my teenage years were spent with an unexplainable dark cloud above my head at all times. I got to skip events and classes solely because I couldn't sleep at night. I'm grateful for the things that I've learned, the people I've met, the experiences that I've had, and I wouldn't change any of those for the world. But it doesn't dismiss the fact that we need to make more people aware of and educated about epilepsy. The fact that these things are not done more openly is what leads to the stigma surrounding it. Epilepsy is real, it is common, it's not fun, but it's not something to be ashamed of. And I really hope that in the near future, we can think 
people understand that. So that must be a term of the shade of beard the way that I did. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. So um, I'd like to introduce Ellen Gibbs. Come on up. And she has a short story. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to first thank um, you all for being here. Um, I'd like to share a story um, as it pertains to my son, Jonathan. Jonathan passed away in January of 2020 at the age of 21 years old due to Suda sudden and unexpected death in epilepsy. And uh, today I'd like to share a little bit about um, his life and why the epilepsy initiatives and support of the various bills is so important. Um, John was born a twin, um, full term, 39 weeks, five days, so full term. <laughs> Uh, he met all of his developmental milestones on time. He crawled on time while he spoke on time. When he was about 15 months of age, he had his first seizure. So, of course, we rushed him to the emergency room. And because he was so young, they felt or they told us at that time it was probably a febrile seizure, which is common in young children. He had another seizure. Again, we went back to the emergency room. Again, we were told that it was probably pre-ball seizures and he would probably outgrow. When Jonathan was five years old, he had another series of cluster seizures. We took him again to the hospital. And at this time, an EEG was performed and he was diagnosed officially with epilepsy. Um, he was placed upon a, a traditional epilepsy medication, Keppra, and he seemed to do well for a while. He may have a seizure every now and then, but for the most part, his seizures were well controlled with the camera. When he was 17 years old, things started to change. And then he started to have what we consider to be breakthrough seizures, cluster seizures. So he would literally have seizures three, four, five times a day, every day. We worked with the doctors at Walter Reed. And then subsequently with the doctors and epileptologists at um, NIH, National Institutes of Health, trying to identify some type of treatment um, that would work for Jonathan. He received uh, a device, Vegas Nerve Stimulator, um, went, underwent surgery for that, and that's designed to, um, I guess, stimulate the vagus nerve in his brain in order to preclude the seizures from occurring. That worked for a little bit, and then they stopped working. Subsequently, again, we work with the doctors at Walter Reed and NIH, and we try to identify a series of medications that we could um, put him on. Unfortunately, Jonathan was tremendously allergic to a lot of the epilepsy medications, and even particularly some of the traditional epilepsy medications. As a result, he developed what's called Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which is a extremely rare and severe reaction to medication. He was hospitalized for two months um, and he spent at least a month in the ICU and actually had to be airlifted from Walter Reed over to Washington Hospital Center in, uh, in Washington, D.C. When he was released, um, finally, in order to try to offer some type of um, solution um, for the seizures or some way to at least control the seizures, he was put on a series of medication, benzoids, which are served to highly depress your, your, your nervous system. So he was on benzoids. Uh, he was taking about 10 pills, 10 to 12 pills, three times a day. And again, these the medications made him very uh, slow, slow the speech a little bit. In fact, I had one of his teachers come and ask me if he was taking, if he was smoking weed, to which I had to explain to him about the medications and the side effects of the different medications. Ultimately, in order to graduate on time in high school on time, Jonathan had to pass the standards of learning and he worked very, very hard. Finally, last day of the SOL, last SOL, he was able to pass it and graduate and walk across the stage on time with his twin brother, Christopher. 
that was probably one of the biggest achievements and the proudest moments of Jonathan's life. He then went on to go to Nova Community, Northern Virginia Nova Community College with the hopes that once his seizure activity was better controlled, he would be able to go to a four-year college along with his brother. Sadly, on the morning of January 3rd, I went, I spoke to my son, Jonathan, and um, made him breakfast as I always did. And when I came home later on that evening, I found him deceased in his bed. With that, I will say this. One of the things that um, Jonathan said to me, and I, I think that this was extremely profound, he came running into my room one evening and I'm thinking, what's going on? And he said, Mom, I wish I had cancer instead of epilepsy. And anybody who knows anybody with cancer or is hurt or has um, experienced cancer knows that that's not something you would, you would want. And I asked Jonathan, I said, Jonathan, why would you say that? And he said to me, Mom, people understand cancer. They don't understand epilepsy. And that always stuck to me, sticks to me to this day. And that, for that reason I, and others, I think it's so very, very important to support initiatives that will lead to um, the correct accounting for people who are impacted by um, epilepsy. Um, and for in, in, in providing research and funds to um, support further research into um, epilepsy and potential treatment. So again, with that, I thank all of you for um, coming out today. Um, and I really hope that um, you are able to inspire your representatives um, to support these initiatives. Thank you. Very difficult story. And so many people have lost loved ones to SUDEP and um, it's a difficult, journey. We need to talk about Sudan more as well. So thank you so much. Um, I would love to next introduce uh, Gabby Conifer, the chair for story of the thing. Thank you so much for being here today. And thank you to uh, Evelyn for sharing her story. Um, so this is my daughter, Vega. <laughs> So I'm mom to Ellie, who is 10, and Vega, who is 7. And we want to tell you a little bit of a different story um, about epilepsy. And you'll see on the screen, this is a, a video we had shot um, and some pictures that you'll see so you can understand who Elliot is and his life as we talk. So um, Elliot was born in 2012 and was perfect and beautiful, um, but very soon we started noticing that he was having movements that were very strange, and unfortunately it took months of trying to convince the pediatrician that something was actually going on, um, and so we lost many months of time and treatment um, for Elliot. Um, he was never developing either. He wasn't making eye contact. He wasn't lifting his head. He wasn't cooing or spot speaking. Um, so things went on like this, and our journey at about um, two and a half months um, of finding out that Elliot had epilepsy when he was not that old, and then actually starting to search for a diagnosis. Um, and without a diagnosis, that meant that we were doing spinal taps, EEGs, MRIs, uh, tissue samples, anything you can think of, blood draws, to try to find what was going on. We spent months of Elliot's life in the hospital, uh, birthdays. Christmases, Passovers, uh, all of the holidays um, that you wish you were spending together around the table and you were around a hospital bed. Um, and more times than I'd like to admit, we were rushed to the hospital in an ambulance in the middle of the night um, and in the code room a number of times where we almost lost Elliot because we couldn't stop the seizures. Um, and so uh, I tell you this to understand that epilepsy is a very diverse disorder, right? You've heard from people today uh, about Jonathan's experience, you've heard free. There are many thousands and thousands of children like Elliot um, who are living with what we call the rare epilepsies. And for these children, many of them require 24 hour day care. Every single thing that has to happen in his life has to be done by myself, his father, Vega helps, 
the nursing care, um, using the bathroom, eating, um, uh, putting it into standards so that we um, can develop some bone strength. Um, our life centers around Elliot. We go out only if we can. If Elliot isn't well, everything changes. Everything turns on a dime. And that has severely impacted Vega's life as well. Um, how she goes to school, um, how she engages in the world, um, and the isolation that we live in. Um, we lost most of our friends. Most people don't understand this life that we live and how hard it is and what it takes. Uh, and I think people are scared by it. And it's, it's very challenging. So um, my husband quit his job when Elliot was about one year old because we recognized that we needed to have intensive care for our child. Um, and still to this day, he has to live on the night schedule so that we, somebody can be watching him 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day overnight. Um, so as you heard um, uh, Congressman Costa say, or, or actually it was working, I think, about throwing spaghetti on the wall. That's basically what it is. Every treatment decision for my son has been a guess. And we've been confronted by doctors saying, this treatment could help or it could kill him. What do you want to do? <laughs> And that's really the challenge right now is that we are not learning from our children, right? There's no system right now for us to gather intelligence and learn from the experiences, the challenges of every single child so that we can do better with our kids and do better for those who are yet to come. So um, I can tell you that as a parent, it is incredibly depressing and defeating to recognize that there's very little you can do to help your child. Um, many families like mine live in fear um, of losing our children, uh, of regressions for our children. We have despaired that there are not the treatments that currently work for our children. So um, that means that we need to do better. We need to do better to understand what epilepsy is. We need to do better and really start to understand what we need to do to change, shift the curve here. Um, and to do that, we need your help. So I'm really grateful to all of you for taking the time to be here today. Um, and I hope that you will go back and share our stories. You can always reach out to any of us. You know how to find Liz, you know how to find Laura, and we can come and speak um, if you need us to come and share some impact stories. So thank you um, for stepping up and, and helping. Do you want to say something real quick? Yeah. Okay. Okay. We can ask her. When I joined my new school, every day I would eat my lunch outside the cafeteria, even when it was raining, just so I could stop myself from getting sick. And I didn't know when my class was going to come out. And I would be punished if I started playing too early. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Wendy and Vega. These are the challenges that we face. Many, many of our families face these challenges, and we don't talk about it. We need to talk about it. We need to expose how difficult life can be. So I want to thank uh, all of our speakers. Um, you can see how epilepsy impacts their lives in different ways, perhaps, but significantly. Uh, we, we need so much uh, to move the needle, as we said, to improve the lives of those who are impacted by epilepsy. And that includes family members, that includes the siblings. So they don't sit outside and eat to, to protect the sibling that they love. So, Again, thank you for sharing this powerful story and your help. So we are seeking solutions in many policy areas, but given the limited amount of time we have today, we want to focus on areas of the federal budget that are instrumental in helping people with their buses. I also want to point out the number of organizations that are behind these efforts. The Adelaide community is supporting these efforts with one voice and that is an amazing feat for so many different organizations you'll see that there are 36 organizations that have signed on to a letter that describes the appropriations asks 
for FYP 24. Next slide. So we want to walk through these asks. Um, and I want to do this. I know we're a little bit behind the time. So here is a list of the asks that we have, but we really want to walk through them and, and describe their importance. Um, so we're going to start with um, programs under the Labor, Health, and Human Services Education and Related Bills. So let's go to the next slide. We're first going to talk about um, the Pediatric Epilepsy Consortium. You heard about the challenges that families face in the pediatric space. Why do we need this type of organization, Gabi? What, what's important about it? As I alluded to, we are not learning from our children who are struggling. We do not currently have a system that is tracking what medications work, what medications don't, what kind of syndromes people are getting, and the kind of impacts that has on them. So if we, um, what we're proposing here is 10 million to start this pediatric onset epilepsy consortium so that we can bring together clinicians and researchers and families to start documenting what's actually happening. And then we can finally start to use data for decision-making as opposed to every time someone gets diagnosed, we guess what to do. Our kids deserve better. And um, it's something that we can do. We've seen it with the, the pediatric uh, cancer uh, cogs um, and it's doable. We just are asking for us to get the process started at this point. Um, and we will be behind you all the way to help guide you uh, from this side. But this is a really huge step in finally being able to have kids like Jonathan be able to say, we know what to do for you. We know how to help you. Yeah, based on real world data that we have today, we need to mobilize that. And we can do that. We need to start somewhere. And that's the big idea behind the pediatric onset epilepsy consortium. Again, other disease areas have been able to enable this and make a difference for the patient populations. There are other, there are existing programs under the LHHS that are important to the epilepsy community. Pre, as a young person with epilepsy, why is the CDC epilepsy program important to you? I think that it's important because it opens up conversations, um, educating people and spreading awareness about epilepsy by educating those essential people in our community, such as educators and people who are constantly around those with epilepsy, whether they know it or not. Um, so it is just very important. I remember when I had a seizure in front of my school, my school nurse had no idea what to do. Mm -hmm. I was literally, I woke up and she was sitting on top of me, which is not a proper seizure for state. So we need to pass this program. We need $13 billion to pass this program in order to make sure that cases like that don't happen. The National Neurological Condition Surveillance System at the CDC was authorized through the 21st Century Act in 2016. It's since been managing demonstration projects focused on multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. But the intention has always been to include other neurological disorders, in, such as the epilepsies. Gabi, why is it vital that the system is expanded to include the epilepsies? As things stand right now, we do not have a true sense of the impact of epilepsy. Um, all these numbers that we have are based on estimates, their best guesses. Um, we need to do better. And this for the, um, the surveillance system that was set up is perfectly poised to be able to step up and start saying, what do we actually know about epilepsy? Who has epilepsy? Where? How are they doing? Um, and so uh, to finally be able to say that we can have a true sense of the scope and the burden of this disorder is going to be huge for us to be able to then be able to say, what do we do about it? How do we how do we move forward and find better answers? Thank you. Finally, there's a registry that's largely funded by the CDC's Safe Motherhood and Infant Health Program and run in collaboration with the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. That has the ability to track pseudepilated deaths of people up to the age of 20. Evelyn, can you speak to why funding for this registry is so important? Uh, yes. Currently, we do not have an understanding or an accurate count of the number of individuals who have actually succumbed due to SUDEP. 
This is so critical and so important because once we have an accurate accounting, then that attention will be there and the research and the funding um, will be will be able to um, be allocated. Um, I'll use an example. If we remember back to the pandemic, when it only impacted a couple of people in a couple of different locations, not a lot of research was done. But once the numbers grew, the attention came, the funding came, and that allowed for the research and the development of medications which could um, treat, preclude, um, and vaccinations that could treat and preclude this. And so again, it's so critical to have that funding available to um, to treat um, the epilepsy and the epilepsy-related um, consequences and, and complications. Thank you, Evelyn. I just want to thank those agencies that are behind this, these teams that are behind uh, moving this, this effort forward. The CDC uh, works hard to understand um, prevalence of disease, disease states, and we need to encourage them to support the epilepsy condition we need to know. And again, the NIH is doing a phenomenal job uh, driving basic research and the translation of research, but we need some more focused attention on the epilepsy. So we want to thank them for their their enthusiasm um, for these programs as we talked to them about these already. There are also a few very important programs in the VA and defense bills. Uh, the military construction VA appropriations bill funds the VA centers of excellence for epilepsy. Veterans can acquire epilepsy for a variety of things, including combat and non-combat events. For example, traumatic brain injury can lead to epilepsy. Given this connection, in 2008, Congress passed a law directing the VA to establish epilepsy care centers within the VA health system. Now there's a network of 19 sites that provides comprehensive evaluation and care for veterans with seizures disorder. The ask in FY 2024 is 23 and a half million, which was included in the president's budget. I want to point out that this is for 19 sites. And this is actually a, an increase. Um, you can see the deep need for our veterans and fairness with these, these centers. And more is needed. The Defense Appropriations Bill funds three vital programs within the congressionally directed medical research programs. These programs are the Epilepsy Research Program, the Traumatic Brain Injury and Psychological Health Research Program, and the Tuberous Sclerosis Complex Program. These programs fund research to better understand various contributors to epilepsy, such as traumatic brain injury, and even diseases such as tuberous sclerosis complex, which is a rare disorder that um, is hallmarked by non malignant tumors that occur in the brain and that can cause seizures. So, through research to improve our understanding, we can improve patient care and outcomes ultimately. And our ask is at least $12 million for the epilepsy research program. 175 million for the TBI and psychological health research program, which actually covers a vast array of research needs, not just TBI. And at least 10 million for the TSC research program. So with that is a summary of the asks that we have. I'd like to invite Dr. Escoletti back up to provide some seizure training. And as we heard, um, in 10 individuals would may suffer a seizure in their lifetime. And I'm someone who has seen and treated thousands of seizures, and it's hard watching them. It's hard each time you see one. But it's important to understand that even if you're a bystander, there are things that you can do to keep a person safe who's having a seizure. So it's important to just remember three words, stay safe side. Really, if you notice someone who's starting to have a seizure, stay with the person during the seizure and until they return to their baseline, keep the person safe. So if they're in a chair or they're near objects, get them to the ground, um, get them away from anything that they may hurt themselves while they're having a seizure and also turn the person on their side. One of the big concerns that people often have is will they choke during a seizure? If you turn them on their side, if they have any saliva, if they have any vomit or any other secretions, they'll actually spit it out rather than swallowing. 
And it's important to note, because I do know it's out there in this community, well, can their tongue go to the back of their throat? Can they suffocate? Can they not breathe? If turning them on their side prevents all of this. And it doesn't matter which side, just get them to their side. You can often place something um, soft, like a sweatshirt or something under their head uh, to prevent them if their head is shaking, to prevent it from hitting the ground and injuring themselves further. But we don't recommend um, surrounding them with pillows or surrounding them with other objects, just something small um, underneath their head would be the side thing. Things not to do when someone's having a seizure. Um, oftentimes, um, you want to hold the person down because it's terrifying to see uh, their extremity shaking. It's hard to watch them shake. But really, nothing you do is going to prevent their brain from uh, stopping a seizure. So we say, don't restrain them. You're actually more likely to injure them if you do. Don't put anything in their mouth and don't try to sweep away anything from their mouth if they're having a seizure. It's actually more of a risk to you uh, that you can be injured. And oftentimes, uh, many people with seizure are having a seizure, their jaws are clenched. If you try to pry their mouth open, you actually risk injuring them even further. And do not give any food, water, or medications until they're able, uh, until they're awake and able to swallow safely. Oftentimes, um, in schools especially, we will have a seizure action plan. It actually um, lists out what to do for the individual patient uh, or person uh, who's having a seizure. It uh, usually identifies the type of seizure, if you have to give medications, and at what point to give medications, or when to call an uh, emergency response system. Slide, please. These are the instances in which uh, you would actually call EMS um, if the seizure is prolonged. So if the seizure occurs and is lasting several minutes, um, often more than five minutes, it actually requires medication to stop the seizure. So it's important to call uh, EMS. If it's a first time seizure or a person who has an unknown epilepsy history, that's an appropriate time. If they have difficulty breathing, or they're not recovering to their baseline. Uh, that's another time in order to call. And of course, if there's ever any concern, we do encourage calling EMS. Um, but many individuals with epilepsy will tell you that they often don't need emergency services. Their families and um, the individuals will often say they can recover on their own. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just very brief, but we do encourage everybody in the room to visit um, the Epilepsy Foundation as well as the Epilepsy Alliance of America. There's actually free uh, seizure training and uh, certification that can be obtained. It's actually very important given how common seizures are to be able to know what to do in these uh, emergency And I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards as well. It is so important that we all learn about seizures. We know what to do if somebody's having a fear talk. We know what to do if somebody's choking. We don't know what to do if somebody's having a seizure. It's made clear it happens frequently and what we need to know how to protect people um, so that they can you know, recover and go on with their lives. As difficult as that life can be sometimes. So I do, I know we've got a few minutes for questions and answers, if there are any in the room. I know we have a few online, but they're a little difficult to manage logistically. So we will get back to you for those questions. Are there questions in the room? Okay. If you guys could say one thing to members of Congress so to make a difference, what would that one piece of advice be to Congress that they do? Um, Rachel, could you re-say the question? Um, so we, the panelists were asked, if there's one thing you could say to Congress what, or give a piece of advice, what would that be? I would say the advice that I give all of my um, patients and their families is that 
As you're living with epilepsy, we still want you to be in the driver's seat and epilepsy in the passenger seat. Epilepsy is really just one component of your life, and we don't want it controlling your life. So what we can do through our policies and our funding and our education and awareness is to make it so individuals living with epilepsy are actually in control, and epilepsy is just a side story. I would say start paying attention, start looking, start asking, because if you do, every single person in this room and every single member of Congress knows at least one person living with epilepsy. If it's one in 26, you know several people who um, experience epilepsy and educate yourself, start learning, be curious. Epilepsy is diverse and can be very severe, as you saw, uh, but it also ma is manageable for some people. So the more you learn, I think the deeper you'll understand the need is for us to find more answers, get improved research, and start truly funding epilepsy um, in line with the, the prevalence and incidence that it is in this country. But, um, I would also agree with that education. Educate yourself. Education is key. Um, as mentioned, epilepsy is very diverse. So there are individuals who can take one medication and their seizures are very well controlled. And then you have other in individuals, like my son was, we weren't able to properly determine what was causing the seizures. We weren't able to determine a, um, a remedy um, in order to treat the seizures or stop the seizures for a long period of time. So again, you know, it's, it's a very diverse and complex ailment. And so therefore I do believe that education is good. <laughs> Going along with that, um, I would just kind of say, listen, you know, listen to the people around you, the people who are struggling, like, they're as, um, I don't remember which one, but one of the senators was talking about how he went to an ALS group, and they were talking about that, and here's for that, but those conversations are really here for epilepsy, mm -hmm. you know, so listen to the people in your communities, what they need, what their struggles are, and help them do. Thank you. Another question. I think one of the things we've learned over the last, we've been meeting with many offices over the last couple of months when we meet you know, the staffers and ask, do you know anybody with epilepsy? And so many times people have said yes, but we don't really talk about it very well. So again, I encourage you to even talk to your colleagues and learn what they know about the epilepsies. Any other questions or comments? Well, I want to thank you all for coming together. It is such a delight to be able to be here in this, you know, first opportunity to come together um, under the leadership of the FFC Caucus. And I want to thank uh, the congressmen for their interest and their willingness to drive that forward. We encourage all of your offices to join on, to learn more, to continue to advocate for um, more research funding and policies that help people with epilepsy. Uh, again, you can find more information on the sheets on your chairs. We ask you to take those with you. And again, thank you. Great job. Thank you so much.